Good morning. Welcome to worship on this second Sunday in the holy season of Lent. It's, it's wonderful to be here together in the warmth of the community. After a windy, and maybe still windy morning, cold, a little bit of snow, but we changed the time. We're leaning into spring and spring leans into summer and longer and warmer days. So this is a, a good sign in the seasons here in New England as we, uh, we tough out the, the winter and and await the joy of uh, spring, flowers, wildlife, everything that comes alive. But as we gather in anticipation of these changes, we gather in a time of change as well, as the world is challenging us. The hostility of the world is, is challenging our faith. We're not sure what to expect. We, we are so mindful, and maybe even spiritually sensitive to the imbalance that we're experiencing. After coming through this, and still in this pandemic, this, this abrupt shift in life, we're now faced with another abrupt shift. In the time of Jesus, there were many abrupt shifts as well. And in the gospel, according to St. Luke, Jesus is confronted with a very powerful shift. God has called him to move towards Jerusalem to complete his heavenly mission as the beloved one. And Luke takes his time telling the story of how Jesus makes his way to Jerusalem. And, and along the way, wonderful things happen. There's healings. But this morning, we hear this story of a reality a reality that Jesus is a marked man and that he has to deal with the shift in his own life as well as the shift that's happening in Jerusalem. Last week we learned and reflected upon the temptations and now Jesus is still tempted. Will he abandon the mission in the face of brutality, the pressures and, and the weight of the Roman Empire and the corruption of the Jewish religious leaders? Will he abandon it and just get out of town? Or will he stay faithful, stay fixed on God's alternative plan? And so this morning, as we gather, we gather here in the midst of those many changes that are happening around us and in the world. And the challenge for us always, particularly in the Lenten season, is to practice what we need to practice to stay faithful to the mission of Christ's peace, justice, and compassion and mercy in the world. So I welcome you this morning to prepare your hearts and minds for the week ahead and to take a rest, take a, take a deep spiritual rest and breath as we worship and celebrate the love of God in Christ together. Thank you to Linda and Caitlin uh, for leading us in music and Callista and Laurel as well. May God bless our time together. Amen.
year's this year's Lenten theme is Seeking God's Way. Today we seek God's ways from security to generosity. A life of following Jesus is always one of seeking God's ways, but we know we get off course. We can have our eyes on one signpost when God offers another. We feel confident of our sense of direction only to be surprised by the ways of God that turn expectations and assumptions upside down. We can get down on ourselves for insufficient planning and need the reminder that God has not given up the job of holding us and guiding us. As we experience the season of Lent and weekly worship, consider being intentional about seeking God's ways with a regular spiritual practice of your own. So now we're going to have the Barry Kids um, answer. Uh, please name a way in which you are seeking God's way during Lent. So Hannah, first. Um, I'm going to clean my room every day. I'm going to what, eat vegetables every day. What are you going to do, Christopher? Go ahead. I'm going to give a hug to my family every day. Very good. As we prepare for, for Easter and the hope of resurrection, we turn off one purple candle to symbolize the second Sunday of Lent and Jesus' journey through the wilderness and toward the cross and tomb. We leave five stones as a reminder that one of them will become the chief cornerstone that the builders rejected. Dear Jesus, we are tempted to shore up our own security instead of trusting in you and in our strength of your community. Open us up to generosity and trust them. Amen. Good morning. Please uh, stand if it feels comfortable for you and join me in the call to worship. Welcome to worship. Gather all who hunger for rest. We are here to listen for the Lord. Speak, O oh God, we prayerfully wait. Open your hearts to the way of Christ. Come all who seek the Lord's peace. We are here for the Lord. Come, Holy Spirit, fill us with your love. Our first hymn is number 139 in the hymnal, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. Praise to the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise him, for he is thy health and salvation. Oh, ye who hear, now to his temple draw near. Join me in glad adoration. Praise to reigning bears the on eagle's wings there in his keeping maintaining God's care and fault all whose true good he upholds hast thou not known his sustaining praise to Prosper thy work and defend thee. Surely his goodness and mercy here daily attend thee. Ponder and do what the Almighty can do, who doth with love doth be friend. to the Lord who doth nourish 
watch thy life and restore thee, fitting thee well for the tasks that are ever before thee. Then to thy need, God as a mother doth speed, spreading the wings of grace Please remain standing and join me in the opening prayer. Lord, your holy word proclaims how a little faith makes a big difference. Spend your life-giving spirit into this place and our homes. Strengthen our will to resist the powers that drain our faith. Lord, tend to the seeds of faith waiting to be nurtured by your spirit. May the fruits of your love be made visible in our worship and lives. Amen. And let's join in the prayer that Jesus taught us. Loving God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The scripture today is from the book of Luke, chapter 13, verses 31 to 35. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. Jesus said to them, go and tell that fox for me. Listen, I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow. And on the third day, I finish my work. Yet today, tomorrow, and the next day, I must be on my way because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stone those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers who brood under her wings, and you are not willing. See, your house is left to you, and I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. God is still speaking. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Linda, for sharing God's word with us and helping us to get ready for worship, to call us to worship, to lead us in prayer. And special thanks to the Shin Berry family. It is so wonderful to see you here. And was reminding me that it's first time back in church in two years. Wow. And that's, that's the case for many people as they start to come back to worship. And many who have been unable to, to find their way here just yet. But we pray as we we move along in Lent that we'll be able to to get together. And having not seen you in a while, maybe I saw you over the course of the summer. And the same thing with Banya and Sabindi. You know, you're growing so much. You're getting so tall. And I was remarking to to Elin that Saffron is almost the same height as, as Elin getting taller and taller, you're all growing. And part of growing is, is being part of the church, right? You know, coming to church is part of your, your way of learning and growing. And it's so good that you're able to come back here. And when you come back, you're taking new roles. You're, you're doing new things, you're, you're reading here. You know, Christopher is uh, reminding us that every day we should be hugging our family and showing God's love to them. And uh, 
you know, you're going to clean your room? I'm going to check with your folks to see if that's, that's going to happen. And vegetables, you, you got to eat, especially the green ones, don't forget. But it's so wonderful to see the children here back with us, and I look forward to seeing more of their beautiful and bright faces as we as we lean into the spring and hopefully uh, out of uh, the season of this pandemic, let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for gathering us here this morning in the sanctuary and at home on Zoom. And it's so important, O oh Lord, for us to, to take sacred time and to claim our sacred space because we feel, O oh God, the shift and the change in the ways of the world. And so we come here as those who seek peace, who those that live a hopeful life, who trust in the way of your son, Jesus Christ. And so as we reflect upon the word that Linda has shared with us, oh Lord, we, we pray as always that there'll be some jewel, some seed, some, some grain that will fall upon our hearts from this word that will shine or take hold or feed us for the purposes of being your people in this shifting and changing world. May the meditations and wanderings of our mind uh, be pleasing to you. May we set aside the busyness in the list that we carry with us everywhere so that we can give our full heart and attention to you. It's in your holy name we pray, amen. Romain Roland in 1924 published a biography of the Mahatam Gandhi. It was a little, it is a little book. He studies the life of Gandhi uh, pretty much the early parts of the, the 20th century. It's a book that inspired many to become a Gandhian. Uh, some who actually left their homes and in Britain or the US and, and traveled to India uh, to be part of the movement for the freedom and liberation of India. And as he concludes this little book, he, he starts the last paragraphs trying to summarize what he understands Gandhi's life to be all about, at least as of that particular moment in time, some 20 years before Gandhi was assassinated. And he says this, not so much just about Gandhi, but about people in general, people of faith. He writes, and I quote, the true characteristic of faith is not to deny the hostility of the world, but to recognize it and to believe in spite of it. Let me share it with you again. The true characteristic of faith is not to deny the hostility of the world, but to recognize it and to believe in spite of it. Jesus, as we heard from Linda's reading of the gospel, according to St. Luke, Jesus, in the face of hostility, violent hostility. In the face of Herod Antipas, hostility, a death threat, he refuses to abandon God's call upon his life. No way. Jesus, instead of turning his back on God and taking the advice of the Pharisees to get out of town, proclaims to the world, to all who were within his voices, 
He proclaims to the world that his ministry of healing and redemption will continue, will continue in spite of the hostility of the world, in spite of Herod, Antipas, effort to do away with him, in spite of the corrupt way of life and behavior of the religious leaders of Jerusalem, in spite of the imperial forces of Rome, in spite of the hostility, Jesus is going to continue along his way. This morning, communities of faith have already, or like us, now are worshiping. Some will worship in the hours to come. And I believe it's safe for me to say that every single congregation that gathers will either individually or collectively be mindful of the hostility that is unfolding in the Ukraine that has been for over two weeks. Congregations and individual believers of all faiths will be praying, praying hard for the victims of this violent and deadly hostility. We can imagine there's a cloud of prayer hovering over the people of Ukraine. People throughout the world are sending up prayers and they're gathering up. Imagine that peaceful cloud resting over such a area of destruction. And beyond prayer, we know that there are resources and financial assistance from all sectors that are filling the accounts of humanitarian organizations and the government of Ukraine. We are so impressed and our hearts are warmed by the strangers that have opened their homes in Romania and Poland on the borders of Ukraine, opening their businesses, turning over food and resources so that others can, can find a place of rest and safety to try to lower the levels of anxiety and distress, to give a child a toy and a smile and to, and to let them know that those that have had to leave everything behind that there are those who have hope and love to share. Today and tomorrow and the next day in the face of the hostility, countless people are acting in faith inside of Ukraine and outside of Ukraine and throughout the world. Today, tomorrow, and the next day, people will organize and resist the powers of death and destruction. Today, tomorrow, the next day, in the face of hostility, there is a growing community of humanity believing in the power, a power greater than the military aggression and uncroaked violence that we witness in Ukraine. Humanitarians of all faith and no faith are refusing to deny the sinful reality of war. People across the globe are deeply grieved. We are deeply grieved. Jesus in his time was deeply grieved by the violent and oppressive actions of Herod Antipas. who like his ancestors, his father and grandfather, took out extreme aggressive practices against his own people. Deeply grieved by the violent oppressive actions of Herod, Jesus laments over the faithfulness of Jerusalem, the holy city now corrupted by self-interest, Religious leaders who have leaned away from God and more into the practices of Herod. And even more troublesome, religious leaders leaning into the practices 
in the will of the Roman Empire. It was the Pharisees that were standing alongside Herod. And together they turned their backs on the will and the way of God. Jerusalem, the holy city, turning its back on God. Allowing corruption and self-aggrandizing religious leaders to have their way. It is that city which Jesus prayerfully laments over. He laments over Jerusalem's failure to understand that God is there for them. That God longs to gather the the people of Jerusalem, the, the people of God, together all under God's protection, God's promise, covenantal promise, always to be their God. And that they would be God's people. Jerusalem has become a house unto its own. Not the landscape of faith, not the sacred space created by the will of God and the people of God. Jerusalem is a house ruled by faithfulness and it so grieves Jesus as he watches the people Ignore the words of the prophets and even kill them. Stone them. Deciding that it's better to go their own way than God's way. And so in the prophetic voice of Jesus, God's broken heart is revealed. God wants nothing more than to embrace God's people in the midst of hostility. That's all God wants. To gather up the people of Jerusalem. To offer a protective embrace of peace, of mercy, of redemption and compassion and forgiveness. God's heart is broken. And we can imagine God's tears soaking the soil of the holy city. We can imagine today God's heart is broken and God's tears falling upon the blood-soaked soil of Ukraine. Where do we find help? Our help is in the word in the name of the Lord. The Psalter for today is Psalm 27. Walter Brueggemann, Hebrew Bible scholar, poet, prophet in his own way, points out that the Psalm has two elements. One is confidence and the other is complaint. But it is this confidence that wins over trouble, says Brueggemann. Confidence winning over trouble. That's what we hear in the words of the psalmist in Psalm 27. The psalmist believes in God's care, that embrace, that that covering up like the wings of a hen. The psalmist believes in God's care and that God's alternative to the present is reliable and present. God's alternative to what we're experiencing is reliable and present. That's the confidence. That's the confidence that the psalmist brings forward, saying, I believe that I shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, the psalmist. And goes on to say, look, look to the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. Wait, look to the Lord. Let your heart take courage. You see, Jesus' kingdom of God movement, as it moves in mass towards Jerusalem, is a threat. It's a threat to Herod because Herod thinks that maybe this will be it for him. 
And the whole movement to make Jerusalem a selfish and self-centered enterprise to benefit the wealthy. Jesus' kingdom of God movement is an alternative to the present. And even the Roman Empire in all its might is starting to wonder, is this a threat? And for the poor and for those that are suffering, the movement, this movement that is moving towards Jerusalem and gaining momentum is an alternative to the present for them, which is impoverishment, violence, and death. And the more time that they spend with Jesus and the more that people listen and see his acts of redemption and healing, they're finding that this time, this present is open to change. And they're discovering God's alternative to war. God's alternative to poverty and to suffering. And that God surely wants there to be an end to anything that separates God from God's people. And God's alternative to war is the work of God's people. It's God's life-giving spirit that inspires us. But God's alternative project, God's project of redemption and salvation, God's project of alternative way of living, not only to war, but to poverty and to brokenness, is the work of God's people. It's the work of the church. In the midst of the present hostility, we, we, God's people, we, the church, must not allow ourselves to distance ourselves. Even though we're miles and miles away from Ukraine, we must not allow our hearts to be distant. We must not allow ourselves in mind and in heart to deny the reality of death and suffering in Ukraine. We must stand alongside our brothers and sisters. We must look to God as the psalmist calls the people of God to look to God to let your hearts have courage. We must not distance ourselves or deny the reality of Ukraine and the suffering of any of God's people anywhere in the world. We must look to God to be strong in faith and act with courageous hearts to, to dare to step outside of whatever limits we set upon ourselves. We must not allow privilege and safety to distance ourselves or separate us from the suffering of our brothers and sisters. We must not forget. We must hold fast to faith. Hold fast to faith. Hold fast to faith in God's way of peace in the midst of hostility. Hold fast to faith. Friends, the powers of death and violence are always close at hand. But now that distance seems so short. So limited. We're called over and over again as Christians to speak against these powers. We're called as people of faith, as Christians, to, to point to the work of Christ in the midst of hostility. Not to, to wring our hands or to lift them in doubt or uncertainty. are called to point to the work of Christ and to engage in it, to take from Scripture an understanding that in these times there are things for us to do. And we can be those people engaging in the healing work of justice and peace, engaging in the compassionate work of making God's alternative visible. 
who are called to lean into the future of Christ's promise coming. That's what the end of the text says. In spite of all of Jerusalem's denial and turning their back on God and the corruption and violence, in spite of all that God is not abandoning God's plan, God in Christ will reconcile all things unto God. Peace in the beloved community will come. And Jesus points to that. This is the work of God's alternative. Reconciling all things unto God's will and way. But we don't have to wait. As Christ comes towards us, we move towards Christ. We must not deny that the hostility that Jesus lived with and resisted is rooted in human, willful, and deadly rejection of God's will and God's way. While Mr. Putin and some others in his corner argue and try to frame the aggression in Ukraine as some sort of holy war. It has no biblical or theological founding. It may be a particular argument made by particular theologians, maybe leaning into particular and very unique biblical underpinnings, but it has no true foundation in the will and the way of God. Just as the leaders in Jerusalem corrupted the word of God and tried to find a way to finagle their argument over and against the prophets. And the only way they could do that was by killing them. And it is the plan that they have for Jesus. But in spite of the hostility, Jesus continues along his way as he says, I have other things to do. Tell that fox, I'm going to go out and heal. I'm going to go out and cure. I'm going to go out and reverse the powers of the demonic. And that's our call too. In spite of the hostilities, we say no. We have the work of doing God's alternative plan to do. And we will continue. We cannot afford or nor take any time to deny today's reality. But we must, as our children have proclaimed to us, take up a practice, a daily practice for us It is, yes, to nurture ourselves, to express love, to clean up our house. But most importantly, in combination with all these practices and acts, we want to lean forward and renew our calls, personal and collective, to faithful action. Faithful action. Lent is a season of looking inward and acting outward. We must pray, we must give, and we must work and act for God's alternative. And that is so desperately needed. As we lean into the season of Lent and and look forward to the joy of Easter where we celebrate how God's alternative claims victory over death. Brothers and sisters, we must practice the alternative. We must speak against war and tend to the work of healing. 
We must look for God in the midst of all that is happening. We must be strong, not idle, not discouraged. We must let our hearts be filled with courage. We must be strong. We must lean in to the way. May God guide us. May God give us the strength that we need. May God's word nourish us. May the spirit of the living God shine upon us. May the Lord connect us in prayer and in compassion and through acts of mercy to the brothers and sisters of the suffering ones of Ukraine and beyond. May God find a way to soften the hearts God's alternative plan is not just for the suffering. It is a priority for the suffering, but God's alternative plan is also for the redemption of those hearts that have rejected God's way. We must pray for those that are inflicting the death and suffering upon all people. Let us pray. Lord, you give us your holy word for your purposes. You have given us Jesus for your purposes. Lord, we pray that your will, your purpose, your alternative way will be lifted up to the many hearts and hands of this world that are tending to those have suffered unbelievable and deadly consequences of selfish violence. Help us, O oh God, to stand firm, to be aware and awake, and to pray without ceasing for your peace in this world. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you again and again for this time. This time where we can come and sing and listen to meditate, to sit in silence. To examine the world through the lens of your word. To ponder in our hearts, you know, what does it mean? What does it mean, oh Lord, for us to be with you? To follow in the way of your son, Jesus. What does it mean in the face of such hostility, such violence? What does it mean, we pray, oh Lord, that somehow you will reveal to us and shape us and form us and use us in the way that we're intended to be used in work and serve, and live. Lord, we know your tears are pouring out on the land of Ukraine. and You can only imagine from listening to your word how brokenhearted you are and how disappointed. And, but we know, Lord, you never give up on your people. No matter how many times or how we do it, when we turn our backs on you, you always face us and open up your arms and forgive. But Lord, you're also the God of the prophets. And so we pray, O oh God, that your word of justice and peace and reconciliation and redemption and repentance will be heard among those that are so affected and painfully in the midst of grief and loss and also among those that are carrying out this war. And Lord, we know that within our own lives and community, 
There are the brokenhearted for who we pray. For those that are feeling like they are exiled or refugees in their own land, and maybe even in their own home, we pray. We pray for healing and strength. Among those that have been wounded by others, or for those who are simply struggling to have a grain of faith. We pray for those that are struggling with the demons of addiction. We're praying, oh God, to you for the power that you have shared with us and the power of the Holy Spirit to reform and change us for your purposes. And that we remain steadfast in these times with the intention, the intention and the active practice of honoring you and your will for peace and justice and mercy. It's in your holy name we pray, amen. Would you please join with me uh, the words that are on the screen, our Lenten prayer for our time and place. Lord, you call us to be fearless in faith and bold in action. Forgive us, O oh God, for turning our backs to you in your way. Our hearts do not always bend in your direction. We humbly pray that you heal our brokenness. Cleanse our hearts so your goodness is revealed in and through our lives. Amen. As a faith community, we, we come always prepared to offer ourselves for service and the work of God's will and way. We also come and during the course of the week offer a small portion of what God has lent to us to care for ourselves, our families, the community and the world. And so we give thanks for these offerings that have arrived here today, as well as during the course of the week. And I invite you to join me in the prayer of thanksgiving and dedication. Gracious God, we thank you for the comforting presence of your love. We offer ourselves and these resources as visible signs of our faith in your promise. May what is offered be free of fear of safety and increase your will and way in the world. Amen. announcements for this morning. There's a church council 
meeting on Zoom at 12.15, so I hope all will have time that wish to participate to get home and refresh yourself and then be part of the administry of the church. Also, we'll be taking orders for Easter flowers. Uh, there'll be a form placed in the narthex. Uh, it may be out there already. Did anyone see them? I didn't. Nope, not there yet. It'll be there soon so that we can uh, place our orders prior to the 27th of March. And that, uh, New England JFON continues its celebration of 10 years of uh, immigration justice and providing legal services. So there's a 1010 campaign and uh, you can uh, go on the website of New England JFON to, to donate if you wish. The book club is uh, here at the church uh, and it will be uh, March 27th, uh, Lincoln Highway by Amore Towles. We continue to participate in a three church Lenten study uh, online, uh, looking at the uh, theology of grace as discovered in the, the classic Les Mis. And uh, Wednesday evening, we gather for prayer online at 7 p.m. And uh, I'll be maybe outside in front of the cafe on the 24th. We'll see how the weather continues uh, Thursday at 10 a.m. March 24th. And we continue, as always, to collect for our local food pantries. And you can see that the collection is due, uh, well, it's going to be April 3rd, and it looks like uh, oatmeal is the featured item. May God bless you and keep you. May God's plan for you in the alternative plan of God's love for the world be part of what you are part of in the coming days. May you stand alongside our brothers and sisters in Ukraine and other places of the world that are in the midst of hostility. May we be those instruments of peace. In the words of St. Francis, may God use us for peace and, and help to shape us for the purposes of God's will and way. May you go out into the world with a smile and hope not denying the reality, but confronting it with love and peace. May you be living signs of the peace of Christ. Amen.